This morning, uh, Pastor Jim read a passage from Mark 16. This is uh, one of the renditions of the great commandment. I've been accused that I can only preach from this passage, that I don't even know how to preach from another passage in Scripture. Well, this morning, I'd actually like to talk about a different passage, if you don't mind. We in the Reformed faith believe that the Bible is the best interpreter for the Bible, do we not? And I'd like to share a story out of Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John chapter 9? And I'd like to read a secondary story that we can use to talk about this idea of being courageous to share. Do you have your Bibles? Turn with me to John chapter 9, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Hear now the word of our Lord. And now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I, now perhaps your Bible says we, and that is a very fair rendering, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Herein ends the reading of Christ's word and may his name ever be praised. Now, bizarrely enough, for those of you who remember, the last time that I had a chance to preach here, this is the passage that I preached from. I've been noodling around. Now, it's not the same sermon. Relax. You you might remember that that sermon was titled, The End is Near. Anybody remember? I had a sign. I carried it around. said, The End is Near. And we talked about two items from this passage, and that is this, this concept of time and this concept of target. Now, again, I assure you I'm not going to preach that same sermon, but I do want to revisit it today because I think it's so instructive to us, especially in this area of sharing. Having courage to share is the idea of focusing our attention on time and target. And by the way, uh, preaching for the EE Sunday in September for me, especially at this church, is a bit bittersweet. You might remember it was five years ago in 2007 that I had the opportunity to preach at this very service at Coral Ridge, but it was the week following the passing of Dr. D. James Kennedy. So I can't help, but as I think about preaching about evangelism in the early days of September, I cannot help but to go back and to think again about the days that I've had the privilege of walking. And, and listening to and observing Dr. D. James Kennedy. And I don't know if you remember, but one of his favorite sayings, do you know what it was? Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Do you remember? Well, by the way, it's, it's not unusual that contained within this very phrase are two ideas. You want to take a guess at what they are? Time, only one life will soon be passed. Target, Only what's done for Christ will last. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to park and think, just noodle around on this idea of time and target for a minute this morning. When I was a boy in school, I seemed to measure time by the second hand of the clock. Do you know what I mean? Literally, tick, tick, tick. It might be feeling like that to you right now as I'm preaching. The last hour of school seemed like an absolute eternity. Now, today I'm 50. I'll soon to be 51. In fact, this very week, uh, September 14th, the day of your EE banquet, I'll be 51 years old, the same age as my friend Jim Carter. (laughs) Now, at this point, thank you. You know, the funny thing is, is I have all these pictures of my birthday, and none of them am I home. I'm always somewhere else. I'm in China. I'm in any, all over the place, but not home. Well, at this point, at, at the age that I am now, time moves at a slightly different pace. I mean, I blink, and another month is gone. Do you know what I mean by this? You know, it seems like I put up the Christmas items, I take them down. I put them up, I take them down. I, I, I'm, I'm to the point now where I absolutely understand the people who leave their Christmas things up all year. (laughs) There just isn't enough time to mess around with putting them away. If you don't mind, I'd like to park out and and think about this concept of time 
for a few minutes this morning because I find it very interesting. As we consider time, there's a couple things that we absolutely positively know is true, and one is we don't know what time it is. History is replete with all kinds of examples of people who thought they had all kinds of time. No other illustration is needed than 9-11, as all of those people went up in those buildings thinking that was just another day. But you know what? It was the last day of their life. None of us know. So, so there are some people who, who say they, they know what time it is, but whenever we hear somebody say, the end is coming on this particular day, doesn't it make you a little leery? I, I think it should. Because frankly, the day will come and then the day will go and the end will not come. No, the truth is simply put, we, none of us here today, know what time it is. But the good news is there is somebody who does know what time it is. His name is Jesus. He is in fact the master of time. He's the maker of time. He's the one who's able to say, here, here, put your, your fish hook in the water and, and here, here, now, now, there's a fish with a coin in its mouth. He's the one who could honestly say, you all go on to Jerusalem, but I'm not going to go because my time has not yet come. He's the one that's plugged into the eternal Father who knows the fullness of time, every event and when it should happen. When this passage that I'm focusing your attention on this morning, John chapter 9, we're studying this this morning. We get a, a clear didactic instruction from the one who knows all there is to know about time, about what your thinking should be and about what my thinking should be with regard to time. The fact is we get so busy, the busyness of life, that we forget to do the main thing. And we should take this warning that Christ is giving us this morning. We should, if we're smart, take this warning and apply it to our lives. The question is, will we heed it? Will you in particular? Now, there's a longtime friend of the ministry of EE. E. He's a wonderful, delightful man. He used to be the chairman of the board of EE e. uh, UK, the, the uh, Britain. Uh, his name is Brian Alexander, and he said this when referring to this idea of, of being an evangelist, having courage to share. He said, John, listen, when all is said and done, more is said than done. And that's the truth in so many of our lives. We talk about it, but do we do it? And as we focus our attention on time, the question is, how urgent is it to us that we do it and we do it today? For the day is coming, we certainly know that from this passage, when, when day will be gone and night will come and no man may work. And here's the question, will you, will you be ready for that day? You know, there is a movie that was about bucket list. I've not seen the movie, but I like the idea. Do you like the idea of a bucket list? Do you have a bucket list of the things that you're determined to do before you no longer can do them? And I would hope that on your bucket list is the idea of being a witness for Jesus Christ and leading someone to Christ. And, you know, the truth is, it seems obvious to us as Christians, but did you know that 80% of the people who are Christians have never led anyone to Christ? 80% are going to go one day before their Lord and Savior with nothing to show as far as another person that they're bringing to the Savior. You know, I could share the, the rest of today I could take of stories who, of people who changed their minds and decided to make this a priority. I'll share with you just one from an email that I received from Japan. We had a leadership training clinic about four weeks ago in Japan. I was in Japan about three weeks ago, and so I met this young man, or this, this elderly man, I should say. And, and when, when I met him, I was impressed at, at how, how quick he was to share the gospel with everyone around him. Well, here's why. He has a brain tumor. And somebody told him that he had six months to live. Six months, that was it. And then it was over. Now, the truth is, we all have a time amount stamped on our life that's ticking. The, the difference between us and this man is we don't know how long it is. He does. He knows it's six months. And so he became determined that he was going to get involved, and he found this thing called Evangelism Explosion. He went to one of our leadership training clinics. This is a man who was a pastor for 50 years and never saw anyone come to Christ. 50 years in Japan. 
Well, now this guy witnesses to every single thing that wiggles around him. And he sent me an email just a few days ago and says, John, I just led two people to Christ and another young man in an assurance of his salvation. He said, here's the thing. I'm going to give up being the, the pastor of the church. We've got a young man who can do that so I can focus full time for whatever my days are left to be an evangelist for Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? And yet we could tell stories from this very congregation. Do you remember Ruth Clark, anybody? Do you remember Ruth? And how focused she became about evangelism as she was in her last days. Well, the truth is we're all in our last days. And what I'd like to do today is to remind us of that. In 1956, there was a very famous missionary by the name of Jim Elliott. You know Jim Elliott. You know of him. He was speared to death along with four of his colleagues by the tribal people that he was trying to reach with the gospel. Jim was a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. About four years before he died, he wrote this in his journal. When it comes time to die, make sure that all you have to do is die. We can't understand how God decides the day of our death. We don't know when the finish will come for us, but we should all live our lives in such a way that when we reach that finish line of our life, there's no unfinished business, no works that God has given us to do, assigned to us, that we've left undone. So the question of this morning is, do you have that magnificent obsession as Jesus did, to do the works that God left for him to do. Because he knew that the night was coming when no man would be able to work. Can we accept this challenge in our lives to be like Jesus in our attitude toward the work that God has gave, given us to do? As Pastor Jim read in the Great Commission from Mark 16. That's the question of this morning. The truth is that works have come on hard time in our church today or in the church of Jesus Christ today. I, I didn't realize this until I had the opportunity to write a book with Dr. Kennedy called Well Done. And as that book got released and sent out, I began to get a lot of complaints about it. People saying, John, you shouldn't be putting people into bondage to legalism so that they would feel guilty about the things that they've left undone. Uh, they, they preach, even though they have uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which very clearly states that, that, that sanctification is this idea of this, this cooperation internally in us being made into the likeness of Christ. These young Calvinists, and if I, if I mentioned their names, you'd know exactly who I'm talking about. They are actively teaching in the church of Jesus Christ today that not only is sanct salvation an external act or commandment of God, but that sanctification is an external pronouncement of God about us and not at all connected to the things that we do. That when we hear well done, if we ever hear well done, it will not be because of the things that we have done. It will be because of the things that Christ has done. This is actually called sonship theology. It's a heresy that's existed for an awfully long time, but it's being resurrected within the PCA and preached from PCA pulpits today. And people are listening to it. They're buying it and they're, they're saying, oh, what a relief. All I need to do is hear the gospel for salvation, and then I can hear the gospel for sanctification, and I hear the gospel every day, and if I ever feel guilty, all I need is the gospel. It isn't that I've ever... By the way, guilt is a perfectly good reaction to sin. Did you know that? Guilt is a perfectly good reaction to sin in our lives. And when we feel it, we shouldn't be quick to put it away. So the gospel for salvation, the gospel for sanctification, your works simply don't matter. Anyone who teaches about works today in the church is a legalist. That's what they're saying. Well, the funny thing was, is as I would chat with Dr. Kennedy, he told me many times, he said, John, listen, it is never legalism to obey God. It is never legalism to obey God. You understand that the definition of legalism is when man adds works that are required to be okay before God, not when God adds them. When God tells us what to do, we should be quick to do it. And that is not legalism to do it or to encourage others to do it as well. In fact, if it were, you'd have to take out half of the New Testament and claim it to be legalism. 
because half of the New Testament is warnings, like the one we're looking at today. So quickly, I want to, I want to, uh, now Anne says this is going to depress you, but I promise you I'm going to do it quick. There are six things I want to share this morning from this passage. Six, but they're going to be quick. Here they are. Number one, first we should realize when we, real, when we read this passage that the work that God wants us to do, me and you to do, is not an accident. It is not an accident. It's an opportunity for us to tell others about Jesus. You, you see that right here in this passage. The disciples had come upon a man who was born blind from birth. And the disciples asked, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents? They reasoned that suffering was related to sin. This man was suffering, therefore some sin must be involved. Who sinned? That was their way of thinking. Well, Jesus, on the other hand, saw the big picture and he knew that with God there were no accidents and that this was an opportunity for God's glory to be revealed, and so he healed the man, and God was glorified. Second, number two, see, I promised they were going to be quick. First, uh, the things that come are not at second. The work that God wants us to do is, please listen, it is an imperative, an imperative. We must do it. That's the word that we would use today. When we don't, we disappoint and we disobey him. It's right here in this situation, Jesus is speaking to you and me about his work, the work that God has given him to do, and he stressed it using this word, I must do the work that God has left for me to do, for the night is coming when no man may work. Uh, one of the things that really troubled Dr. Kennedy, it drove him crazy, was theologians who would sit around all day thinking about what we should do instead of doing anything. And frankly, it bothered Spurgeon as well. Spurgeon said this. He said, the Savior has a greater respect for work than he does speculation. Now, I'm going to say something to you that you may not agree with. I don't think, frankly, it matters your understanding of everything. I think it matters what you do. Because what you do demonstrates the faith that you have. And the faith that you have is what you believe. And what you believe determines who you are. Do you understand what I just said? It's great to have speculation. Jesus gives us the answers. He gave his disciples the answers when they asked the question. If we'll ask the question, he'll answer and he'll give us the truth. But here's the thing. He's more focused on what you do, not what you think. Now, that's counter to what you hear in a lot of churches today. Because the reason why that is, and it may sound odd again, I'll say it one more time, what you do is actually what you think. God sent us to do his work. He's determined that we would do this work. Christians, God has given you work to do. So we must be determined to do that work that he gave us to do. You, you see this very, from the very beginning of Jesus' life. You remember that story when his parents had come to the temple and then they're off and they're on their way home and he was supposed to be with somebody else, but then they realized he wasn't and they went back to find him. You remember this story from Luke chapter 2? And, and Jesus says this, he says, know ye not that I must be about my father's business. He used those words on and on again and with Nicodemus. Don't you know that I must be lifted up as the serpent was living up? Don't you know in Luke 9, don't you know that the Son of Man must suffer many things? He had this idea down pat from the very beginning, this idea of the necessity of doing the work that God had given him to do. There were sheep to be gathered. There were souls to be rescued. There was glory to be given to God, the Father Almighty. And you know what? You know the truth? That work still needs to be done today. The need is great. There are men and women who are perishing without the gospel and without Jesus. Our cities and our countrysides, they are crowded with people who've yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And the church remains nearly silent. The need is urgent. And here's the question. Will you reach them? Will I? Do we feel compelled to do this work? Could we say with Christ that I must do it? 
Now, thirdly, we see that in this, this passage that the work that God wants us to do is particular, and that is that we are to be his witnesses. You might ask, John, why that particular work? Isn't there a lot of work to be done? Why can't I do this or that? Why do I have to do this witnessing thing? Why are you always focusing on that? Well, it's simply because Jesus did. In this passage, he said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And that, of course, is referring back to what happened in the, pa- in the chapter just before, in John chapter 9, where there's, there's this wonderful image of the celebration of the Feast of the Tabernacles and the, the pouring of the oil and the lighting of the candelabra. And in that wonderful moment, Jesus said this incredible statement. He said, I am the light of the world. And of course, you do know that in Matthew 5, 14, he said something else pretty incredible. Here it is. Ready? You are the light of the world. So then Jesus is saying that the main thing is that we would reveal him, that we would illuminate this truth of who Jesus is to this lost and dying world. That's our main task that he's given us. Fourth, we see from this passage that the work that that God wants us to do is compassionate. Do you see what he did? He cared for this broken, blind man. He, He loved him, and so he ministered to him. And frankly, that's our task as well. Here's the, here's the real challenge for me today is this question. Do we love others? Now, I think it's great that, that Pastor Jim says that he thanks me to be a compassionate man. I can assure you I'm not. That it is only God's Spirit working in me that makes it so. It is only being able to see with His eyes the things that are around me that ever give me the opportunity to act in a compassionate way toward others. Do we see others and do we want to help them? And do you know that the grandest help that you and I can offer to anyone else is telling them about Jesus, the light of the world? There's an illustration that should cause us pause. You know it very well. In fact, if you come to our Share Your Faith, I should say when you come to our Share Your Faith workshop, you'll get a chance to revisit this story. It's the story of the prodigal son and the father. You know this story from Scripture, right? Uh, The son takes his inheritance, runs off, spends it on low living. When it's gone, he decides to come back to the father. He says to his father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Do you remember what the father said? Anybody? Quick. What did he say? You know, honestly, this is a challenge for me. How many of y'all are fathers here? You have children, right? I mean, you can put yourself in this situation, and I have to be honest with myself sometimes about what I would say instead. And you know what I would have said? Where have you been? What have you been doing? And, And where's all the money? You do know that that was half of my estate, right? Uh, why on earth would you have done that? You are not a good son. What what am I going to do with you? What could you possibly expect to receive from me today? I mean, I could hear myself saying that, but is that what the father said? No, the father came running and he threw his arms around the neck of his son and kissed him and said, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill him and lead us or or let us eat and be merry for this is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And he is found. And, and in this parable, we see this immense love of God the Father toward those who are lost. We know that sin absolutely is despicable and repulsive to God. And yet, we also see this great picture of God running toward the sinner, embracing the sinner, giving that sinner a chance to repent. And I, again, this is the hardest piece of this for me. Does that describe you? Running toward those who are lost? You know, I, I, I said a few things at my TV set in the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you guys did. I, I watched some things that I probably shouldn't have watched. And I have to tell you what, compassion toward others is not the first thing that comes to mind. And, and, but I think the truth is that this is a picture for us to be reminded again that we are to be compassionate toward those who do not think like we do, who do not know what we know, and who have not heard what we've heard. There's number five. Fifth, we see in this passage that the work that God wants us to do is comprehensive. In, 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 in other words, it includes all of the things that, that, 
we were given to do, not just parts of it. The Christian life is not a smorgasbord. Now, you know, some of you guys like to go to these smorgasbords where you pick this and you don't pick that and you can kind of put together your own meal. And sometimes we in the church think the Christian life is like that. Guess what? It's not like that. We, we're not given the, the right or the opportunity to pick what it is that we'd like to do. Notice that Jesus was not selective in the works that he chose to accomplish and ignored the ones that he didn't want to do or didn't feel good at. He said that I must do all the works, plural, that God sent him to do. All of them. We know from the Garden of Gethsemane, this is all the illustration we need as Jesus prayed. Blood drops were coming from his brow, and yet he obeyed. Sixth and finally, whew, see, the end is near. Sixth and finally, we see from this passage that the works that God wants us to do are, and this is where we started, will end again, bounded by time, and time is short. We must hurry to do what we must do to today because the night is coming when no man may work. Now, frankly, these are striking words from Jesus, the master of time. He was Christ. He is God eternal. He was there forever in the past. He'll be there forever in the future. He's not bounded in time for him. If anyone could have said, I'm going to take today off, it would have been Jesus because he's a master of time. And yet he was concerned about doing what it was that God instructed him to do in the moment that God instructed him to do it. And he was aware of the fact that time was passing. And if that's true of Jesus, how much more true it should it be for us, creatures of time, and for whom time is passing. Richard Baxter once said, I preach as though I ne'er may preach again, as a dying man to a dying man. The hard truth is that life will come to an end one day for every single one of us and, and, and for the people that we're supposed to witness to. And today is the opportunity for us to serve Christ and to share the truth of Jesus with them. We, we don't know how long that opportunity will last. And I have to tell you, again, from watching what I've seen in the last couple of weeks, I have to tell you, the time is more urgent today than it ever has been. There was a man by the name of Dr. Carl F.H. Henry, who was a visiting speaker at a seminary when he spoke of the frightening rise of the new barbarism in our age. Do you know what I'm speaking of? The barbarians are coming, he said. He compared paganism, the paganism of today, with the barbarian conquest of Christian Rome. He said, they are coming in science through the misuse of new discoveries. Anybody seen that? They are coming by manipulating what it is that men feel like they need in public opinion, is sending them toward base or bad needs. Anybody see that in our society today? They're coming in the religious realm as the institutional church fails to do the work that God has given it to do. And we see an increase today in occultism and in cults and in Satanism. Can you believe that? Increasing today. He goes on to say that that this movement will obscure the vitality of revealed religion. It will deter churchgoers from piety and saintliness. And in so-called enlightened nations, not only will the multitude soon relapse into a retrograde morality, but churchgoers will live in a Corinthian immorality and churchmen will encourage situational ethics and the lines between being a Christian and being of the world will be blurred to where you cannot any longer see a differentiation. Doesn't it sound a bit like that's what's happening in our world today? Do you know what the corrective for that is? Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more patriotic that we can do as Dr. Kennedy would oft say, then share the gospel with our friends and with our neighbors and with our relatives and with our work associates. And as we share the gospel, listen, I don't care if they love it, share it anyway, because they need to hear it. And as we do, we will see our world change. Wake up, get moving, serve, give, sacrifice, suffer if need be, but please witness for Jesus Christ with all of your being in this day while God has given you this tiny window of opportunity. 
One day, Dr. Kennedy and I was talking, we were talking about the church of Jesus Christ and the duty of every Christian, that we had to do the work that Jesus had given us to do. And he said, John, have you ever heard the statistic that 20% of the Christians in the church do 80% of the work? Has, has anybody ever heard that statistic before? 20% do 80% of the work. Well, I had heard that. In fact, it may be more fairly said today that about 10% do about 90% of the work and of giving, of witnessing, of, of, of doing the work that needs to be done, teaching, all the things. He said, you, John, you want to know the saddest part to all of this? I said, sure. He said, here's the thing. The 80%, they don't know that. They don't know that there are 20% of the people that are doing all of these exciting, wonderful things. And then it seemed to me that he changed the subject almost abruptly. He said, John, do you think that there will be crying in heaven? How would you answer? Well, I said, well, I, I don't think so. Doesn't the Bible say that there will be no tears in heaven? He said, uh, 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 John, John, go back and look at it again. What does it say? It says, and then God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh. He said, John, do you, do you want to know what I think they're going to be crying about? I said, I'd love to know. What is it that you think that they'll be crying about? He said, I think it will be this moment when they realize what they should have, what they could have done for Christ and yet left undone. And then it will hit them and they will weep. I now understand or understood that he wasn't changing the subject at all. What a profoundly sad idea that there will be so many that will be distraught in that last day over what they have left undone. The truth is that Jim Kennedy was one of the busiest guys that I had ever met. He had sermons to prepare, a daily radio show to do, a weekly TV show to put together and put on all over the world. Uh, all kinds of ministries that he had to oversee and run. And yet, do you know where he was on Thursday night? Anybody want to take a guess? E.E. -E. Why was he there? Was he there so he could witness? Uh, probably not. I mean, the guy witnessed to, every, witnessed to everything that wiggled around him. If you were ever out with him on lunch, he witnessed to everything. It wasn't so that he could witness. It was so that, it was so that he could teach you something. And that is how to keep the main thing the main thing. Are you a leader in this church? Are you a teacher? Are you one of the, the elders, the deacons, ones that oversees? You know, I, if you don't mind me being so bold as to say, you know what you ought to do? The, the first thing that you ought to do is witness for Jesus Christ and take a team out, teaching them how to witness as well. Uh, are you a regular, ordinary lay person here in the church? Well, what ought you be doing? Well, I believe you ought to be learning to witness or witnessing, one of the two, learning to witness or witnessing, and then some of you he will have called to be part of training others to do that as well. The good news is, here, listen, please, I, I may have gone a little long here this morning, but hear this. The good news is accountability helps. I, I, I know it does for me. And, and the great news is, is that this church is willing to offer accountability in this area. You have a pastor who believes in personal evangelism, does personal evangelism, and is committed to training y'all. You know how rare that is in the world today? Praise God you have such a pastor. Well, that accountability is offered at this church. You have an opportunity to put yourself under that accountability this very week. On my birthday, they're going to have a banquet on Friday night. I would love it. In fact, I would consider it a birthday gift to me if you'd show up. Wouldn't it be great if this many people came to the banquet on Friday night to talk about being witnesses for Jesus Christ? And then a Share Your Faith workshop, which Art Hallett is teaching. You know, you used to have this guy named John Sorensen that taught these things. Well, now you've got a real teacher. Art Hallett is coming. And he's going to do a great job on Saturday. This is an opportunity for you to come out if you've never done this before and learn how to do it. Well, maybe you've done this for years. This is a great opportunity to come out and sharpen your skills and maybe help somebody else that's learning it 
for the very first time. There, I've said it. Now you have to decide what it is that you will do with this news. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon will its fleeting hours be done. Until in that day the Lord I meet and stand before his judgment seat, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. And the still small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens and hopes and fears, each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or for his will. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love in fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will, pass, will last. Only one life, yes, only one, and let me say thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call and know, I'll know that it was worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let us pray. Oh God, please forgive me, forgive us, when we become altogether too infatuated with this life, a life lived for our sakes and for our purposes. We see that you have built us for a very particular purpose and given us work to do, very specific work to do while we're here on earth. Help us, oh God, to do it, to be your witnesses for Jesus, for, for, for everyone that we meet. Allow us to be part of reaching the very ends of the earth with the gospel for your sake and for your glory. And I pray that this upcoming EE -E banquet, that everyone that's here will feel compelled to come and that this church will be a church that is known wide and far for being witnesses for Jesus Christ here in Pompano Beach and even all over the world. For I pray in the precious name of Jesus, even the Christ. Amen.